right, so uh, ready to get started. Uh, this is the May Austin iPhone Developer Meetup group, and uh, got a bunch of stuff planned today. Uh, first thing I wanted to do is give a shout out to our food sponsor for today, uh, Cinch.com, and uh, they they have a mobile SDK for uh, in-app messaging and video messaging and instant messaging, pretty much all your mobile messaging needs. Uh, they've got a mobile SDK for that. And uh, Karen's going to talk a little bit about how their product works later on. And then uh, we also have a giveaway today. We're giving, um, we, if, you've probably heard of the website ObjectiveC.io. They've got a bunch of different issues where they cover uh, topics from, from core data to video editing. And uh, they, they've got 24 really awesome issues, and they kind of finished doing that about a year ago. And then they wrote three books. So they've got um, Advanced Swift, they've got Functional Swift, and they've got Core Data. So they've got these three books, and they, they gave us a digital copy of each of those to give away. So um, it's one, one pack with all three books. So we're going to give away that today at the end of end of the talks, we're going to go look on the meetup RCPs and uh, randomly <coughs> choose someone. And if you're here, then we'll, we'll give you a copy of the books. And then also we've got uh, Stephen yeah. from uh, uh, Stephen here to talk about the three-day startup wireframe competition. So I'm going to give him a minute or so to talk about it. Now, come up here if you want. Yeah, sure. Hey. hey guys, my name is Steven. Um, I'm here on behalf of Three Days Startup today. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's an organization based out of Capital Factory, a uh, nonprofit. It puts on startup weekends for universities around the world. Uh, this summer we have a conference called the Global Roundup, where we're taking alumni from all the programs around the world and they're kind of descending on Austin. Uh, we have some entrepreneurs, investors all coming to the conference. That's part of it, we're doing a hackathon. Uh, it's not your typical hackathon though, so we're having a wireframe competition. So everybody who uh, uh, is intending to, attending this conference is going to submit an idea for a wireframe, a, a, a submit a wireframe for an app that they want to build. And then uh, our hacking team is going to choose the winner of this wireframe competition, and then we're going to do a 24-hour hackathon uh, to build this uh, uh, the wireframe into a real product. And then the hackathon team is going to present the final product to the conference attendees. So um, if anyone's interested, we're going to be putting up a blog post and I'll be sharing it to the meetup group. That's one way. It'll have all the information about the hackathon and how to apply to it. Um, also, you can contact me if you're interested. Uh, my email, I can write it down on the board or something. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. My email is shlooney at gmail.com. So I'll just put that up here. And I'll be sticking around in this meeting. I'm an iOS developer also. So if anyone's interested and wants to get more details, feel free to reach out. Cool. Thank you. Yes, 3 Day Startup is awesome. I got the two of their hackathons, and they've been my favorite hackathon I've been to. So definitely, I would definitely recommend 3 Day Startup as something worth doing. Cool. So our two talks today are. Uh, Karen from Sync, she's going to talk about the, about uh, their mobile SDK, and then after Karen, we're going to have uh, uh, Lewis talk about uh, using NVVM and other approaches to building testable iOS apps. So let's get started with Karen. Hey,
So yeah, there's a lot of competitors. I guess the biggest one in, um, in the sphere would be Twilio. Uh, and so in effect, so it is a really cool uh, little startup out of Sweden. Uh, it's spun out of uh, this slightly um, bigger company in Sweden called Reptel. Uh, it's like Sweden's version of Skype, but you know, smaller and Swedish. <laughs> and yeah, um, so basically, Cinch allows y'all to incorporate um, phone to phone calling, um, in app calling, SMS, uh, instant messaging, video, and verification. Uh, and for Android, there's a something called flash call verification, which is really cool. So basically how that works is uh, you have you need to put your number in the app and it'll call your it'll call that uh, phone and verify it instantaneously. Unfortunately that's not yet a possibility for iOS just because Apple is very restrictive in that regard. I don't know why the specific reason behind that is, but nevertheless it's a really cool feature that you can if you work with any Android dev shops or any of your coworkers use that. It's a really neat feature. And yeah, um, basically, yeah, this is boring business stuff. Uh, Voip, uh, voice codec, basically what we do is, um, it's the system's redundant enough that it, it really eliminates a lot of latency and so you have really great voice quality and yeah, um, kiss you bowing. Uh, PSTN is basically your landlines and your old school types of phones, which you can also access. And yeah, call setup speed is pretty fast, uh, hence the name such such to use. Uh, without further ado, let's get to coding. Uh, and you know, live coding got to be with us. <laughs> Where do you drop the actual call? Where do you terminate on PSTN if you go over a voice or IP? Right, so uh, we do both vo voice over IP vo uh, calls and PSTN, and the specifics for uh, call termination, um, I can't really talk too much about it, um, but um, nevertheless, it's a, a really cool, um, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend uh, looking at the SDK um, the specifics, um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just show you a quick demo in regards to that. Gosinch.com and log into our dashboard, which should be plugged in already. And so yeah, uh, here you have your our main dashboard. Uh, it tracks down the call, the answered calls, uh, call durations, um, total calls in general, uh, as well as if you're doing uh, messaging, it gives you the number amount of messages that you've used. You get you know your logs, your reports, uh, the apps that you've created. Unfortunately, for you know when you, whenever you create a new app, uh, there, we don't have a delete function yet, so that's why I have all these random apps here on my page. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to have the functionality to delete apps. But yeah, um, we're just gonna go very quickly to the quick start and create a quick app. So let's see. And so yeah, um, we have app to app calling, which you know it's mostly all via um, voice over IP. App to phone calling, which is what we'll be using right now, um, and it's messaging, SMS, verification, and the video is still in beta, but you can still access it via if you download the SDK itself, and it's a lot of fun. Really like it, uh, and we'll be doing it for iOS, of course. And yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So does that, if you're using this SDK, does that mean that uh, you could use an iPod Touch, for instance, and get right. all of the capabilities uh, exactly. without actually having a phone? Exactly. Uh, as long as you're connected to Wi-Fi, you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. It, I mean, it's a really cool SDK that you can use for basically all your communication needs, and yeah, it's it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you without you having to actually. You know, try to negotiate with, uh, I guess, phone companies and whatnot, and so do it all for you. Um, the pricing model is pretty, you know, manageable. Uh, 
I think it's half a cent for every minute that you use um, when it's PSTN to app. Uh, and yeah, it's currently downloading. Okay. Can you get like a dedicated <laughs> phone number for your for your application? Exactly. You can um, uh, buy uh, dedicated phone numbers for whatever application that you're using, and basically. If, for example, like say you want to have a, a dedicated phone number to, you know, send out verification text messages, that's definitely a possibility. And, yeah. And that, that. Yeah. And full disclosure, I'm not an iOS developer per se, but you know. Um, I do, my background is in web development and Android, so I apologize if I can't answer most of your technical iOS questions, so please bear with me. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, right away we got the app running, um, you know, and we entered the game, so, you know, log in. And would anybody like to volunteer their phone number? If not, I can just call myself. Eight one seven nine one four nine one four 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 one one. Cool. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hello, world. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, as you can see, uh, it's a really, really awesome ability uh, to, you know call within the app, oh, sorry, I'm going to call. <laughs> uh, and yeah, uh, you know, it's really, really practical. Uh, let's see, let's go into the code itself. So does the, the name that you typed in, mm -hmm. is that actually what shows up in caller ID? No, it will just so be an unknown. Un unknown number, okay. yeah. Uh, and you can eventually, you can configure that to, you know, actually show your ID, but for the time being, um, when it's app-to-phone um, calling, it just anonymizes a phone call from the app. Okay. Um, yeah. So when you can change it, does, is the user allowed to put in anything, or is it set to something in particular? Uh, in terms of anything? Well, I'm thinking of security or spoofing or things. Right, yeah. Um, in that regard, uh, we do take measures to um, you know, to make sure that you know, nothing malicious is being done, and so you can't actually, you know. Uh, There's a limited pool of numbers they can use. Exactly, you and so. Set, you can set your phone number that you want to show to be anything you want. Um, I mean, not, I don't know this program, but mm -hmm. my, that, my, my dad does really old yeah. phone system stuff. I know you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> just from just being around his office. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, and, um, so basically, you know, uh, when, you are, you know, testing out uh, or trying to implement uh, the SunTrust UK into your application. You basically, uh, for example, right here, we start the, you, you invoke the Cinch client, um, start the client with application key, um, and so, I guess I'll show y'all, <coughs> the key and the secret, uh, which you can find in your dashboard. I'll go back here. Can you do like a full H323 signaling? Like that it's dialing, it's calling, it's ringing on the other side, or yeah. it gets a busy signal? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, that, and that comes all included into, in the SC, demo SDK. And so you can, you know, if you wanted to, you know, say, use another tone or use, you know, your own UI, then you're free to change the code for yourself and, you know, customize it for your needs. Uh, and so, yeah, going back to the app section, Go here, and so let's see. Got the keys right here, and boom, you got yourself your key and secret. Uh, anytime that you need to create a production level app, just create a new app and just click production, and you're good to go. Uh, and when you when you first you know sign up for Sense, you get two dollar credit, and that is really you know worth a lot. Uh, should you need more credit, you can let me or uh, Christian, which I'll show at the last slide, um, to, to you know, 
bunch of the pre credits for more testing. And yeah, again, like I said, the pricing's pretty fair. Um, it's half a penny per minute uh, when you're doing uh, phone calls and video calls as well. Uh, for verification, um, I think flash call is like one penny. And yeah, it's a pretty manual prices. Um, and yeah, the instant messaging also is a pretty cool feature. Um, but let's see. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, it's a message. I want to see it. Yeah, um, so let's see. Yeah, that's the most like, in demand feature. <laughs> right. Like, um, like a bot or something. Uh, something Yeah, like um, instant messaging um, works great natively, um, but I must say that for JavaScript, for web um, messaging, it's not a forte for sure. Um, I know there's a, quite a few other providers like Layer and um, other services that do offer um, slightly better uh, web messaging, but for mobile, it's pretty, pretty good. Basically, um, it's just anonymized. Like we don't have any specific um, carriers that we necessarily use. Um, but yeah, it's uh, w when you're using the messaging platform, the SDK, um, it's mostly peer-to-peer -peer or app-to-app -app messaging. And so yeah. Um, so, so you can't. So you like you just called him. Mm -hmm. Right, but you're saying with the SMS, it, you can't just SMS to somebody that doesn't have the app. The app. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can do SMS to people who. Um, so, like for for instant messaging, that's going to be app to app only. Okay. So somebody has to have that app. Okay. You have to be you know contact. You have to have each other in your contact list. Um, but for SMS, uh, that's you know for all oh, any, oh. any phone numbers. Yeah. And so. I thought that's what I understood. <laughs> but yeah. And so, yeah. So yeah, the you know the, the UI is totally customizable. So if you already have something in, in store, uh, you all you have to do is basically just uh, implement your app secret and key, and <coughs> pretty much good to go. And then let's see what else you need to do. Yes, yeah, so there's. It looks like the SDK like sends you message, like sends you new message, that kind of stuff. So you can just create the UI yourself. Exactly, and yeah. Um, Again, iOS is definitely not my forte, so I can't really pinpoint where exactly you can do that, but 
Yeah, um, everything with the Sunshine SDK is to, designed to be fully customizable to your needs. Um, it's really just like the back end and, you know, that's stuff that we take care of mostly. Um, so, you know, again, you don't have to go through carriers or anything. All you have to do is plug in our code and you're good to go. And so, yeah, any further questions in regard to some short implementation? Um, yeah, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Yeah, uh, again, it's a pretty cool uh, SDK and it, it works incredibly well. Um, definitely would recommend um, testing it. You know, you have $2 free credit and that's enough for thousands of calls, messages, and replications. So it's definitely worth a try. And without further ado, let me go back to this. And yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, hello at cinch.com or tweet at us at cinchdev. Um, yeah, without further ado, that's all on my behalf. And happy to talk to y'all afterwards if you have any further questions or you know, need anything from me on my behalf. So, so you so. said it does do S SMS? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so SMS, uh, instant messaging, um, <coughs> that's app to app, um, app to phone calls, app to app phone calls, and um, verification, both for SMS and um, flash call verification, but that's only for Android. And uh, the video is currently in beta, um, but it, it's being flushed out as we speak, so hopefully that'll be up to par for video messaging. And at the moment, it's just one, two, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, messaging, so you can't have like a conference call and have like multiple people on one stream, so to speak. But yeah, that's been my behalf. I thank y'all very much, and yeah, enjoy the Peterries. <laughs>
Um, but when we take this into, when we take into account the first you know, thing that I said, the first supposition, right, like things get harder as, as our app gets bigger, um, we tend to not move fast and necessarily break things. We eventually end up moving slow because everything is broken. Right, so we're afraid to touch code because last time we did it didn't go so well, or maybe we pushed it and everything blew up. Um, and we learned very quickly, right? Like there are parts that we just don't want to deal with. So we have legacy code issues that happens to pretty much everybody at a certain point in your life cycle of the app, or all software really you could extend to. Um, so perhaps the better way than moving fast and breaking things. Uh, move at a moderate pace and fix things along the way, right? So I'm going to talk about some kind of iterations of tools that I've been using um, to try to keep a handle on just how crazy the code base is. You know, just um, you know, basically building in our assumptions so that others know what they were, know what they are, and know when they change. Um, so let's see. Step one, let's write some tests. So for this uh, demo purposes, I wrote a small, tiny app. <coughs> it is called UberX, and that's not original at all, right? Uh, so you're like, hey, UberX already exists, but this is a little bit different. This is going to be Uber, uh, let's see, wait for it to come up, if it comes up. Uber Extraterrestrial. Uh, <laughs> so basically, this is uh, my vision of when Elon Musk takes over Uber, what we'll all be looking at. Uh, so basically, it's very much similar to Uber, right? Uh, we have some locations at the bottom where we would like to go. Um, maybe I'll make that bigger, actually. We have some locations of places we would like to go. Oh, too big. Um, and we have some like providers of you know that service, right? Who can get us there? So if I'm going to the moon, uh, I have to go to Kennedy, Kennedy Space Station. Uh, if I'm going to the International Space Station, I've got some other options, right? Um, Cape Canaveral. And if I want to go to Mars, oh, sorry, you can't go there. We got no rockets going there. Um, so this is my UberX. Um, it doesn't look different than probably the most basic apps anyone's ever written, right? So we have a storyboard. Um, we've got some. We've got you know. A, Obviously, view controller, view did load, we kind of wire everything up. Um, we get a couple of IP actions, right? So when the slider changes, we get a call back to say, like, hey, the value changed. Uh, we got a button that shows the menu, and we got um, the map delegate, and a reload call that basically handles fetching destinations, or fetching uh, you know, available departures for a destination. Cool. So this, uh, like I said, isn't really much different than most apps, or most really simple apps. Uh, so let's test this, right? So let's, we want to test the slider. So the thing about testing uh, UIKit, right, is like there's some magic involved, right? Like we don't get access to everything that UIKit does. Uh, so anyone who's ever tested a view controller has probably seen this like little incantation. Um, basically, you know, you load a view controller like you would normally. Uh, you set it as the root window like you would normally, and then the like key piece is like you got to access the view right, so that we get all those like view callbacks that you would expect in a regular app, and we do all the things we would do in a regular app, right? Like most of my configuration is in view did load, so basically if I don't get that call, like no tests are going to pass ever. Uh, so accessing the view load uh, triggers all of the lifecycle events and and those callbacks so that I get a state that I would recognize. Um, so we go into test slide, right? Um, now, so this is the tricky part, right? So we have one big view controller. It's got a bunch of stuff configured. They all talk to each other. Um, so testing it kind of has to be at the unit level is the view controller, right? We're going to unit test something, but like my only entry point is the view controller. So. Uh, this is a basic test where I'm going to change the slider values and basically use like some key value encoding to check that that you know my map is changing with my slider. Basic functionality, right? Um, but because I'm using like the view controller level stuff, that has to be asynchronous. Uh, so we end up with this kind of like um, 
expectation predicate and wait for expectations with a timeout, and the timeouts are set to two seconds. Um, so but go for it. So it's even like uh, I seen you imported like XC test. Yeah. What is that? I don't know. Oh, so XC test. Okay, cool. So um, so this is like the base level of starting unit testing. XC test is the built-in uh, unit test framework. Um, so it, they'll, they, basically whenever you start a new project in Xcode, uh, they're going to give you a skeleton, one skeleton unit test that says like, implement me please. Uh, most people don't, <laughs> which is why I'm giving this talk. Uh, but yeah, XC test is the basic, it, it generated basically, um, you know, gave me this teardown method and this setup method and gave me like the bare bones like, here is a method where you put a body if you want to test stuff. And then I filled in these details, right? So I filled in, you know, uh, getting the view controller set up, and then I filled in, you know, basically, let's change some values and test them. Um, so I think these pass, right? Like, we do tests, like, I change my values um, of my view controller, and then I test that, like, my map responds. Uh, I also test that when I have zero places to go, that I get my alert, right? My pop up. Um, kind of, you know? So the way I test that, right, is checking just that there is. A presented view controller doesn't really tell me much. It tells me that something's on screen. Good enough for now. Um, so, what's the problem with this, right? We wrote some tests. It's good. It's a really nice first step. Um, but we have external dependencies. So, one thing my app is doing, right, is it's reaching out to the internet, or in this case, like a server I'm running, and it's like grabbing data. Uh, pretty much guaranteed that's going to fail at some point because APIs change. Um, so not the best thing, right? We're testing kind of something we don't control. Um, async is brittle. So that thing where I said we're gonna wait two seconds, right? We're gonna say this thing's gonna change. Wait two seconds and then check it. Uh, guarantee you that will break when you push it to, say, Travis CI, um, because it's really, really slow. So you're left with kind of this weird place where you're like, do I wait longer and waste more of my time when I'm running locally? Or do I just like watch things fail randomly when I push to a cloud provider? Um, hard to isolate different logic, right? So basically in my test, I'm changing the slider value. It's then grabbing, uh, going to a client implementation, and then it's pulling down some information, and then it's parsing that. And then it's uh, creating map annotations, and it's putting those on the map. Uh, so I'm putting in slider value, and I'm getting out map annotations. All of the stuff in between has to work for my test to work, but if any one of those pieces breaks, I don't necessarily know where it is, right? So I'm putting something in here and it's coming out here, and if it breaks, I know it's broken, that's good, but I don't know where. Um, so we can do better. Uh, extracting some dependencies and mocking dependencies. Um, let me get some new code here. <coughs> All right, so basically uh, the first step to a better solution. Um, if I expose, uh, normally like right, the, the, the nice way to do things, right, is to expose your dependencies in an, in an init method, in a constructor. Um, but because this is a view controller, right, constructors have to basically be, um, they have to override the constructors that are already built. Right, so Apple can uh, create this from a storyboard for us, basically. Uh, which means we can't add arbitrary parameters to a, to a constructor. Uh, so instead, I have to, I'm gonna expose my client implementation, right? I'm gonna expose the part that fetches data from the internet. Uh, and I'm gonna expose that so in the test, I can <coughs> fake it. Uh, so that I do not have to actually reach out over the internet and go get it. Um, so my new updated test, uh, up here, right, we have implemented, we've created my view controller, and then I've created, um, I've created a basically a fake client. Uh, so this is Moya. Um, I could kind of get into Moya a little bit later. It's basically just uh, a project for building API clients. Um, and one of the things it gives us, one of the nice things it gives us, <coughs> right, is that it actually has some built-in stubbing. Um, so within here, I've filled in some fake data, right? As I've said, here's some sample data. Here's what I expect my response to look like. Um, and then back in my test, I can configure it to say, 
immediately stubs. So don't go over the internet, please. Uh, just give me back what I gave you, and I'll test that I can handle what I think I'm going to get. Um, so this allows us right, to get rid of all of that async stuff. So now we've changed the value, and we can just say, check if this is equal. Um, it's all happening con like concurrently now, instead, or synchronously instead of asynchronously. So we don't have to wait around. Uh, it's just going to change and be working. OK, so this is better, right? We've removed our external dependency. Um, we've basically been able to mock our client, like we've put in a fake client. Um, <coughs> What is wrong with this situation? Uh, so it could still be difficult, right, to work with UI Kit. Um, so there's going to be things that are hard to basically mock. Um, we're exposing states. So I've kind of let my client become a public variable now because I have to, so I can change it in testing. <coughs> but I didn't really, I don't ever intend anyone to actually change it. Like if anyone changes it in the app, I'd probably be upset because it might not work right. Um, Hard to isolate different logic. We're still putting things in that you know from the slider values, and we're still getting out map annotations, and everything in between is still kind of like, who knows? You know, we, it's got all work, but we don't know when it breaks, where it breaks. Um, okay, so MVVM and RX script. Uh, so MVVM is basically uh, just another paradigm of of kind of like grouping your functionality, right? So we have MVC from Apple, everyone knows that one, right? Like MVVM is basically said, you know, there should be view, um, there should be our, our business logic, which is our, our uh, view model, um, and then of course our model, right? Um, so our model has our state, our view model has our business logic, and our view is strictly platform stuff that gets put on the screen. Um, the lines get more blurry in practice, yeah. Question? Uh, Rx Swift, um, so reactive uh, <coughs> patterns are kind of a thing now. Uh, it is very, very deep of a topic. I'm uh, happy to talk with anyone who's interested in it, but for right now, most of it's going to be magic. I'll point it out, tell you kind of what it does, um, but basically, it's a, uh, a framework for writing, um, writing uh, basically, I guess you could. Callback isn't the right word, but bindings. callback oriented, what's that? Bindings. Yeah, bindings. I mean, it's basically if you took callbacks and made them imperative, right? So I don't want to like say you call this and then you call that and then he decides who he calls. I'll just say like here are the steps and whenever something comes, like whenever something triggers this, these are the steps you take and then this is who you tell about it. Um, so it's basically setting up, I guess, kind of like pipelines for, for data and for actions. So, let's update our code again. Okay, so now we have uh, this explosion of code. Um, so, disclaimer, I put a bunch of files in, or a bunch of classes in one file. Probably not the best thing to do, but the easiest thing to present. Um, so we have our model, right? Our model is very simple. We have destinations, so that's the slider. The slider determines our destination. And we have annotations, and that's what we show. Those are what ends up on our map. Uh, we have our view, and the views um, for me have been very simple. Uh, basically, um, anything that's an IV outlet usually ends up in a protocol that's a view. So basically, my view controller is actually my view for most purposes, um, but I deal with it through a protocol. That way, in a test, I can give it something that's not a view controller. So now instead of an XC test, you're using like RX and Moria? Uh, still using XC test right now. Um, RX Swift, I'll show you RX Swift because it's easier seen than kind of described. Um, Moya is basically, let's see. So Moya, I'm also using RX through Moya to muddy the waters further, but Moya is just this. Uh, so it's a class, it's a framework, right? But so it says if I, if I create a class like this that has a URL, paths, um, a method, so get, post, patch, parameters, so not using any, uh, and then the sample data to fake it. Um, I can take that and it's going to turn it into a client. So I'm going to say, here's what, you know, here's how I describe my client, and it's just going to give me back a client that's going to hit those URLs and give me data. So it kind of works like a router in uh, 
Alamo Fire. Yeah, exactly. It's actually built on top of Alamo Fire. Oh, is it? Um, and you can do all of this same stuff with Alamo Fire. Um, I'm still a little on the fence over whether it gives us much, much more than Alamo Fire. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really thin wrapper around Alamo Fire. And then it gives you mocks for all those as well. Uh, yeah, you can you can you can create this this fake data to basically mock it. Cool. Um, right. So uh, my view controller um, now has uh, my view model. Right. So I created this class that basically like extracted my business logic out of my view controller. Um, now one of the good things here, right, is that I've got this in it. So now I can actually pass in dependencies. Um, and I can go one step further and give my dependencies uh, default implementations. Uh, so here I'm saying, here's a client. Normally I want you to use the real thing. Uh, so no, I'll just create that for you. Uh, normally I want you to use a regular model, so I'll just create that for you. But in a test, I'm capable of swapping out either of those things. Um, and you can imagine the number of dependencies that could exist that would be in this init, right? So if I was using cinch, uh, I could have you know cinch with the regular implementation, um, but then in a test, I could potentially create a fake implementation or wrap it in a protocol so that I can create a fake implementation that I control, right? Because I don't necessarily need to test that cinch works. Um, cinch should test that cinch works. What I want to know is that when my code calls it, I, it's calling what I expect it to call. Uh, so here is a bind method. So basically, within the view controller, which we've kind of gutted a little bit of, of some business logic, we just call, we create a view model, um, right? And then we bind, bind, yeah, we use, we say call bind with the view controller. So basically our view controller is our view. So we're just telling the view model, Hook into, hook into the view, um, and this is where the Rx part comes in, because Rx makes that a little easier, right? So if I get this view up here, and again, it's the protocol that the view controller implements. So that way, when I need to pass in a fake one, I can. Um, this is kind of the magic, the Rx Swift stuff, right? So Rx is is going to give us these extensions. So a slider has a value, you can call it, and it gives you a value. Uh, now it also has an Rx value. And an Rx value isn't going to give you, um, isn't going to give you a response immediately. <coughs> what it's going to give you is a hook to basically tell it you want to know when it changes. So when I basically subscribe to Rx value, every time that slider changes, I'm going to get called back. Um, and this is what I'm talking about with the kind of like just setting up data pipelines. So I can create a map and say like, every time I get called back, here's how to change what you're giving me into what I want. Uh, so in this case, I'm changing it to a destination. Um, take the slider value and, and determining where what it's actually representing. Uh, International Space Station, the Moon, or Mars. Uh, and then I'm binding it to my model. So I'm saying, keep this in the model. Um, in this case, I'm double binding, right? So my view, when my view changes, it goes into my model. When my model changes, it updates my view. Uh, this way, they're always in sync and you can kind of look at either place to know the state, um, which tends to be helpful. Uh, I'll show you in testing why that can be helpful. Um, and then I have my model destination, right? So when this is basically saying when the destination, oh, this is a double binding. So this is when the destination changes, change the slider. Um, when the destination changes, this is another place where I'm also listening to the destination, right? When it changes, uh, go out to take my client and go give me the data for that update, right? So destination change, give me all the new departure locations. And turn those into annotations and then put those in the model. Um, and then finally, listen to the model annotations and update the map, right? So I've been able to like compartmentalize all the things that I'm doing. Uh, <coughs> slider changes model, model fetches data, Data changes model again, and finally, uh, map or uh, model changes map. Right. So all of those things that were before, all in one method in my view controller, are now kind of individual actions that all work in concert. Um, so, what does that let us do? Uh, 
that lets us test each one of those things individually, right? So I want to know that when my slider changes, that my model changes. I can test that, right? So I change my change my slider value. Um, this is kind of a peculiarity of RX Swift. You have to tell it that it changed. This is the way it hooks into the system. Uh, so tell it that it changed. And then test your model. So my model should reflect that change. So this is all the same stuff I was testing before, except now I'm just testing the slider to the model piece. Um, within this piece, right, now I can just test the model to the data fetching piece. Uh, and then find that I can test just the, the updated data to the map piece, right? And then lastly, I can use, I can check that my alert is shown. This is kind of like a business logic rule, right? If there's no departures, show an alert. Um, and the way I'm going to test that, right, is I created this fake view. So my view controller implements a protocol that is my view. Um, so within my test case now, I can make a fake one. This is completely fake, has no view controller, has no guts, has no UI kit stuff. Um, and within that, right, I don't actually have to show the alert. I don't have to worry, like, you know, I can kind of, I can assume that Apple's alert stuff is going to work, right? Like, in general, it's probably going to show up on the screen. All I want to know is that my code triggered calling it. Uh, so within this, this is just a Boolean flag, right? Like, did I call this method? Um, so it kind of lets you kind of draw lines around how far you want to test. Uh, in this case, I only want to test up until the point where I'm going to create a presented uh, view controller. And everything past that, I'm just going to assume works. Um, so it, do, it lets you kind of draw some, some nice little lines. Let's see. So what's the problem here? Uh, this isn't really a problem. I just made one up. Um, could be more descriptive. Uh, so personally, I like specs. And those really, I just made that up so I could just put the slide in. I like to write specs. Uh, so let me show you specs. Uh, So this is this is quick spec. So now we've moved on from XC. Uh, we're no longer using the built-in unit test. We kind of are underneath the covers, um, but I'm using now instead quick spec, which is a testing library that somebody wrote on top of the XC test. Uh, so what is what's nice about this? Um, well, it just kind of lets you do things in a way that's more readable, right? So I have methods that are called test slider, test map. Um, and then I have assertions that say these two things are equal. You don't really know what those two things are. If you're not, you know, if, if I wrote the, the test and then you came along to like change it, you might not know the two things I'm saying are equal or why. Um, you just know they're supposed to be equal. So if they're suddenly not equal, you, you either come find me and you're like, hey, like, why is this test failing? Or you sit there kind of like scratch your head a little bit and wonder like, do we really need this? Or is it just like a test that got written that is no longer relevant? Um, so the only thing that specs brings to the table, the only reason I like it, is it gives you a human readable description, right? <coughs> I'm going to test the slider. And I'm going to test that it maps a value to a destination. That, to me, is, is worthwhile. Um, that the next person, when this test fails, hopefully understands what was supposed to be happening. Uh, and the same goes for all the other tests, right? I'm going to test the client. It fetches departures scheduled for destination. Uh, I'm going to test the map, and I'm also going to test that the map shows an alert if no departures are scheduled. All right, so what's the issue with this? Too much code. Uh, I'm working on this one. Uh, it, <laughs> just in this small example, it worked out to be like 50% more lines of code. Um, a lot of it is like boilerplate. like. I've got this feeling like at some point I'll end up writing like a Ruby gem or something that can generate <laughs> like a bunch of skeletons for me and make this easier. It hasn't actually felt like it's taken that much time. Uh, I, I definitely feel long term um, having the tests and even having the, the quick specs um, have made me more productive. Um, but it is definitely something like if you're not into testing or if you've got a teammate or a coworker who's not in testing, it is something you will hear. Like, it is more code. And it's true. Uh, I'm writing more code. Uh, let's see. So, other tools. Um, so, that's basically it for unit testing. Um, there's a hundred other things, right, that you can use to, like, keep your project manageable. Um, here's a couple that I'm particularly using. 
uh, so SV constants. There's like, in Android especially, uh, Android's fixed this I think actually, um, and in iOS, right, there's like magic strings, like, like give me the menu storyboard, where menu is a string. And if like, I change menu um, somewhere, like let's actually go change something, right? Like, uh, so I have, I have a menu storyboard. Um, I decided it's actually multiple menus. Uh, I'm gonna call it menus instead of menu. What's gonna happen? Well, my compilation's gonna succeed. That's pretty cool. Um, and my splash screen's gonna come up. That's cool. And my menu is gonna crash. Why did it crash? Well, it crashed because I'm loading that storyboard by a string in my code. And my compiler has no idea that that string corresponds to a storyboard. That's all just done at runtime. Um, so magic strings kind of kind of suck. Uh, they, they don't really give you you know, they don't give you, they basically you lose the power of the compiler. Um, so SP constants, what SP constants does uh, is basically, you update this code again. jumps it in so I know I have it. Um, so SP constants is going to gen take is going to like basically parse through my storyboards, extract those strings, turn them into enums, and then I can access my storyboards and view controllers with an enumeration, which is type safe, right? So um, it does require the extra step that you rerun the SP constants like generator. Um, but if you do that then if someone changes menus to menu to menus or changes a view controller name or the hundreds of other strings that are littered throughout your app, um, you'll know it, like your compiler will tell you, uh, which is helpful. Um, doesn't happen all the time, it does happen occasionally. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, Syncs, uh, this is kind of just, this one be careful with, it's actually kind of crappy. Uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's buggy, it it's comes out of Venmo. Um, basically, uh, so one of the things, right, is like I've obviously got all of my classes top level. Um, that's not very good organization. So maybe I start making groups, right, and I put classes in groups. Uh, but then you go to disk, right, and you look at it, and they're still all top level on disk. They're just the grouping is like this fake project file thing that shows up <coughs> on your uh, IDE. Uh, so Syncs is basically going to go through your project file and put those things where they go on disk, right? So if I created this group models, and I put my models in it, and then I run syncs, it's gonna take these two classes, which used to be top level, and it's gonna move them under a directory that mirrors your groups. Um, it's helpful, uh, it keeps things organized. Um, it's a little bit buggy, they do break sometimes. Uh, so I use that, but I <coughs> recommend it without some caution. Uh, rake. So I also have usually have a rake file. Uh, so earlier when I was talking about testing my client, my API client, um, I built in some data, right? I put in some data that says this is what my API response looks like. Just use this. Um, so you don't want to go to your actual API, right? Because like APIs change and then your tests break. You don't want to not go to your API because APIs change and then your tests don't break. And you do want to know that. Do you want to know your API changed and your app broke? Um, so basically what I do is I usually include a rake task to periodically refresh my fake data, right? So uh, you can use, you know, basically, um, you can use, you know, Ruby just to grab some, grab data and save it to disk or, you know, curl or what have you. Uh, but I usually have a task that's like rake update, you know, canned API responses. Um, and that, I run that periodically to make sure my tests are still in sync with the real world without having to always hit the real world. Uh, that's pretty much where I'm at with testing. That's, that's, I'm doing this in production. Um, I've got an app that's probably 30,000 lines of code, uh, 20,000 lines of tests, um, roughly. 
Yeah, so roughly. It well, it, it also includes like API responses, which you know, you, you're probably like 10,000 lines of tests plus like API responses, which can be big. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's worked out fairly well. Um, I mean, our, our cadence hasn't dropped as it's gotten bigger, right? So this is an app I started six months ago. And it's, we've actually been pushing more code faster now than when we started. Uh, which is a good sign. It's typically the opposite, I feel like. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, this is something I'd recommend. Some, you know, give it a try, see how it feels. Uh, and if it's not for you, then obviously it's arbitrary. Yeah, it's um, as a newcomer, do you have any uh, suggestions for maybe some resources for um, testing the iOS? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't have anything concrete, right? So like Objective-C.io has some stuff on testing view controllers. Uh, Natasha the Robot has something on testing view controllers. They're basically going to be clustered around step one, where it's using XC test and testing the platform by input, like by uh, creating the view controller. Um, I think that's a good place to start, actually. Uh, like, I mean, I, I'm basically like showing an iteration of where I've ended up. But if I was just starting, that's a great place to start because it's lighter weight requires less code up front. Um, and it kind of gives you the chance to decide, like, are you seeing the benefit, right? So if you're seeing the benefit, then you can invest more later. Um, and if you're not, then obviously you can cut it loose earlier. RayWenderlich.com. Uh, RayWenderlich.com is also a, a good resource for the just the basic part. If you're just starting out and you don't really know much information about it yet, and you just want to you know, play with it a little bit, very good for the basics. Thank you. Oh, lastly, if uh, anyone's a VC, I am accepting money for Uber <laughs> Extra Trash. <laughs> you know, slated to hit the market 2050 or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks. Have you used uh, the Xcode 7 UI testing? So I haven't. Uh, I did that way back in the day, and it was when it was like really bad, and then we used Appium. Um, which also I don't typically like that much, but I'm going to soon. It's like on my to-do list. Um, I like to start with unit tests because they're so fine-grained, right? So like, I find it easier to wrap my head around. I feel like it's smaller chunks of time. I feel like they're less brittle. Um, a lot of the UI testing stuff, I feel like goes back to the original problem of like, if you're testing everything in concert all at once, it tends to break more. Um, and it tends to break in ways that aren't necessarily, uh, like, just aren't easy to figure out. Um, but with that said, there's nothing that really replaces a smoke test, right? Like, to be able to say, like, before you push your app, I can log in, and I can purchase something, and I can add something to cart. Like, you have to do that. Uh, so better, better that it's done by a robot, right, than me all the time. Yeah, I don't think so, it's meant to replace uh, just complicated. Yeah, definitely. No, I agree. Um, so it's it's like it's a step beyond. I think it's like my next step. But uh, it's really easy. You just hit record. Uh, yeah, I, do I saw it. And, and so it does it work? Like you used it? Yeah. It doesn't. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, like for <laughs> some of the things you're saying, well, for much log, better than before. For login <laughs> and like and so it lets re it record stuff for you and like refact live refactors like recording. Uh, and then it also like waits, like if, there, if, if yeah. there's like a, a alert pop up, it'll like wait for the alert to pop up and then click it. So it's kind of like smart about how it goes. Yeah, it's, it's on my to-do list. I think it's, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I just had tried it way back when it was like JavaScript and it yeah. kind of didn't oh, yeah, work. Yeah. You know, and you're like, yeah, eh, yeah it's still a little, still looking my wings from that. UI automation. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's on my list. And what, what about um, snapshot testing? Have you so I haven't done that. I think it's valuable in a lot of ways, but I haven't done it. Um, I think it's less valuable about, uh, so I think, I guess, again, I'm starting at the basis tier, right, where, like, the thing I like about the specs is it not only tests my code, it also tells other people what I thought my code did, um, which isn't always clear. Um, I think the snapshot testing would be really good at telling you when things changes. When, when things change, which is going to give you a lot of false positives, um, but I think it's probably worth it in a lot of cases so that you know when things change and you didn't intend them to. Um, what is, what is snapshot it? testing? 
So basically, you could create. Uh, you talk about the Facebook project, yeah, right? Yeah. So Facebook has like uh, a testing framework where you can basically give it a view, and it's going to uh, rasterize that to a bitmap and compare the bitmaps over time. Um, so you'll know when your view changed, uh, whether you intended it to or not. A lot of times you are going to have intended it to change, um, but if you didn't, then it's caught something, right, that it's basically caught a regression that you were unaware of. Um, I do know RT uses it. I have a lot of respect for those guys in general. Uh, so probably valuable, but haven't tried it. Yeah, it makes your pull request look cool, because you have screenshots in your pull request. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll send you that. Although I'm not real big about putting you know, PNGs in my repo, but you know, whatever. Um, cool. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Are there any um, timing issues with when your outlets get initialized versus when your view model is binding for the reactive stuff? Do you have any problems with any of that? Sorry, what was that? When, uh, I'm just wondering uh, if I saw you initialize your view model at the end of view did load, and I'm yeah. just wondering how about timing with the binding to the to the outlets and stuff like that. Yeah, so I think uh, I feel like someone's going to correct me here, but I thought. Um, all the outlets get initialized a step before. Well, in they do. Yeah, yeah, so you should never get there and have a nil outlet. Um, I haven't seen it. But yeah, there, there was definitely, um, I, I definitely had some concerns early on of other things, right? Like where maybe it weren't yet initialized. I haven't seen it yet though in practice. So. We've still got uh, until 9 o'clock that we can stick around, um, have any other food that's still left over, and then also we're going to do the giveaway. So for that, if, uh, if someone can go to the meetup page, there's a, I put a, a script in there that you can run to choose the, uh, the winner so that I'm not responsible for choosing. So if someone, if someone can Did you write the code? No, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't write the code here. So if someone can uh, go to the meetup page, and, or if someone can volunteer to go to the meetup page, then... Uh, What's the... Can you go to the phone? No, it doesn't work on the phone. Yeah, if you go, if you, if you go to the... Uh, yeah. You got it? Okay, Matt's got it. Display? Is everybody here using um, Google App Engine as a back end? Or anybody that's interested in doing it? No? It's got something that's really, really neat. Um, you, can, you can define your endpoints in the strongly typed semantic, and it will generate all the client side libraries for you. So your your app stays in perfect sync with your backend API, and it's all strongly typed. So you've got no JSON parsing, and all that shows stuff written for you. It's really nice. What's that? So Google's got this. Um, you know about App Engine, right? Well, they have a technology that sits on top of App Engine called Endpoints. And even if you're not using a strongly typed type language, um, you can, it's, it's got a, some, a decorator semantic where you can introspect it and you generate a JSON document and then generate all your client libraries. So you got all your, you, first of all, your backend APIs in perfect sync with your client, all the code generated for you, and you got, and it's strongly typed. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. So are you currently using it? Yeah, we're using it on, on, on the project right now. Cool. Do you have like a giant API to run into it? And this is it's, it's, it's not that big of an API right now, but it's damn nice. Every time we improve it, we just we just run a script and it generates all new client. And it's all strongly typed. We got 
we got no JSON marshaling, we got none of that pipe checking, we don't have to write any out marks, most of our stuff, it's just all written for us. It's really tough. So, I don't understand, what would be, what would be the problem with like, losing time? What would be the problem? Well, it's just that, so let's say a backend developer sends you a, a string when you're expecting an editor or something. Then you you got a your, your JSON parsing. And I don't want to farm around these, some of these other libraries make this thing easy, but you just have to keep all this stuff in sync. This does it all, and we don't write any code for the back end. All we have to do, the only thing you want to do, which what we're doing is writing a, um, an API wrapper that returns all data into and out of the back end API in local models rather than in message types. Because you don't want the message types to lead all through the app because the back end changes. And we got message types all over the place that doesn't change. So we, we keep our the messages, the, 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 the strong type messages that are generated for us, we keep them just hidden in the API manager. And everything into and out of the API manager is done via local models. Oh, what's the what's the product? Is it in the app store or is it some of the development? Yeah, the product's uh, two months away from launch and it's uh, still. Like I had done RX right. before and I did that thing. Yeah, yeah, I think time. that's the big thing. Um, and I've done kind of, I've done like, thank you. I've done some unit testing before, like done that style of unit testing before. So like, I had experience in this thing, uh, but there was infrastructure that I didn't know, right? So like learning our script, which is slightly different than our show, uh, that slowed me down a little bit. Oh, um, okay. Getting like, like originally, right? Like we didn't always like have like a rake task that fetched our API responses. So like, that tended to be brittle and cost us time in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, so there's definitely been steps of where it looks like, like we're just now to where things generally like, we have to write very little like scaffolding around the test. Um, but I'd say before we had the API updating, before we had uh, like, we created like a, like an equality kind of wrapper that lets us skip values, right? So like when we update our APIs, yeah. all the IDs change. Yeah. Um, and like, I don't really care about the IDs. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I don't really care about the IDs changing, right? So like, I basically created a wrapper that like, deeply, d does deep equals, but lets us mark it because I don't care. Oh, oh I see. Right. I thought you meant all the key names. No, so the, uh, the, no, I got you. the keys stay the same, like the ID value, Sorry? value is different, I don't care. So okay, so you can skip over. Yeah, I yeah. 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 like updated as well. I don't care. I mean, as long as it's a date. Yeah, but, yeah it's good stuff. But yeah, yeah so that, really awesome. that costs us some time. I'm really trying to say. But I'm really trying to I think it's more um, This is probably like the most thorough I've been about testing. There's only two of us, so. But it's, I mean, it's been pretty good, yeah. Like the. Curve is going up on GitHub, which is nice. You know, like, yeah. you know, like doesn't typically happen. Yeah. Uh, I think part of that is that there were some costs in the beginning. Yeah. But also, I think you know, like, now we've got something that works really well. That's yeah. For sure. Like, the jump over the split, like, like yeah. the yeah. first couple days. Yeah. You know, cool yeah. prototypes yeah. across the uh, shop. Uh, right? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think about the promises <laughs> stuff? Have y'all, any of y'all use that or do you like it? I like the concept. Yeah. I haven't used it in Swift. Um, because I'm using because I'm using RX, which has its own kind of it's, it's basically, yeah, that's a version of futures, right? It's just, it's a, a more evented, both are pipelines, but one's kind of more evented and yeah. one's kind of more. Yeah, they both do the same thing in different ways. Uh, so, uh, I guess since I'm using the RX stuff, I don't use promises, but I've used promises for like other stuff in Java. And they're really nice. Uh, I mean, like, the features and promises is kind of what I did in no, no, I haven't. That's, that's the next step. I, but would, would promises in RX Swift be directly competitive? I was thinking more like I was thinking RX is more about binds to the UI where promises are just pipelining in any kind of logic that aren't necessarily tied to the UI. Or is that... Um, they're basically like different implementations of the same idea. October, uh, okay. So with RX, I find it less, like I find it more confusing to basically get all the data running. Like I find promises to be more understandable early on. Um, but like once you get the RX stuff, so like instead of promise, right, they'll have like a subscribe or an observable and a uh, subject, right? So like the terminology has changed. 
but once you figure out how to use them, they're going to suck up. They're just the promise. I mean, they're basically like, I give you this thing, and then you'll get you know, an alert out of it when I'm done, when I put something in the pipe. Basically, um, I find it more confusing now to get get going with RX, but once you get it, they both do the same thing. They both have the same exact functionality. Interesting. Where the promise is just really, it seems very clear. Like, I'll give you a promise, and you'll usually have, I don't even know like, what the Swift version is, but like Java, you have like a resolve, or like a, you know, fulfill, or like a, you know, whatever. So, are you, oh, it's an instant message, so you have to have an app to the K2P, or is it? RX tends to be a little less simple in that way, but it's still the same guy. Okay, so, very cool. And in this case, like, there's a bunch of software to end for it, so I just use that. Like, yeah. <laughs> And there was, I didn't, I haven't seen as much stock in IO. We actually have a Swift library that allowed them to like the connection. So at the end, uh, like I mentioned, right now I didn't have to fill in the year for that everybody's the same channel. I would just plus one and give them the second chance. It's all for now. Private chat was the same. Uh, and I think it might be worthwhile to push your device and it like uh, uh, separate your model so that's and part of the auto and it's actually pretty easy to get it to the server and then you can put a hand like the provide the model view to the application view. So that's that's sort of how I really are you looking for really like it's a lot easier to set up because like if you can if you can say hey click this button and then do the actual but I don't wanna I don't wanna have to wait a second. Yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. I've got, I'll like, come out if I can get I've got some ideas, right? So, like, my, my idea for the automation stuff is just so literally a stuff. Yeah. 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 Did you work at TI and like batteries? Make sure we get down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I actually, I worked in the back. But then with, with the model view, view model stuff, right. Right. Uh, yeah. kind of what he was saying with snapshot yeah. testing, yeah. Yeah. I kind of got this idea like I could just get it later. Because it's it a double bound, right? Like the UI sheet is going to the yeah. And so I can actually what about do the original sitting back around like you're at the Yeah, can you hear I'm asking you to finish it in the co op. It's more of a pipe dream. Okay. I don't know if I'll get to that, but like it's like, which one it seems like it'd be cool. I don't know if I'll ever look at the thousand pictures that it exists, but. Yeah, it does seem cool. No, no, no. Like, a little bit. And yeah, the. Oh, you're too. Oh, I changed one thing. I have to go regenerate all the pictures. It was a pain. Yeah. But it was just me on my own project. Yeah. Full time working into. So, like, you know, by the team of five. Python. Could be. Data ports. Be more useful for. Yeah. Currently working on. I'm kind of. Well, I guess I'm I'm of the opinion that like as long as like you're just gonna do it, I don't have to be like. Yeah. I've run all that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what, do I, what do I care? Like, yeah. the yeah. server's turning out pictures, I really don't care. Like, that's fine. Like, yeah. 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 But, uh, but yeah, yeah. if yeah. the yeah. comes back on, you're constantly having to, like, if it's constantly, like, false positives, yeah. that's right. But yeah, it's, it's, not it's server, something I want to do. So yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. But, uh, you do have like a week of like, like a you know, fix it week coming up. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Some, cool. yeah, some of that yeah. stuff. Yeah. There's so much to be done there. I'm Lewis, by the way. Lewis, my personal opinion is that Apple. Also, you blew my mind on uh, yeah, SD yeah, concept, yeah. especially for developers. Uh, I've never heard of it. And you keep all the yeah. magic strings like that. Yeah. yeah. Holy like, shit, talk I need that right now. It's like. I mean, I, I still have to like run it from the command line, right? Like, but uh, but yeah, it does tell you it's great. I mean, it's not you know. I mean, because you can be surprised often, right? Like, yeah. Oh, that storyboard doesn't exist anymore. Somebody changed the name. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and we just we're just trying to not in the testing here, but we don't have the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so when we, when we have a tester go through, it's specifically like, hey, we rewrote the documentation. Can you go through every step of it, right? And it's, um, every time they get to see the storyboard, you have to walk them through and we're like, just do what it says, but every time you mess up the name, so. What, uh, where are you working now? Oh, um, the Zar Voice. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah. The biggest stuff that I'll see that we have in the prototype so like, Which prototype apps and make some SDKs. Yeah, so, the SDKs, uh, testing is iffy at this point. Okay. Like I said, you know, they have a risk. Instructions. It's not done much testing. Like, Intel has some place where it has, like, high power computers. I feel like I mean, I feel like SDK is a good place. For you. Yeah. So like it's, it's, a, it's a little weirder, like if you don't want to like obviously like anyone using your SDK right now, any tech decision you made. So like, it gets a little weirder about tools and what you've got. 
not yeah, well, uh, well, it's, 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 it's nice because like uh, uh, the SDK and the, the testing can be almost separate. You know, any of the yeah, I assume we'll have the chance to better support testing, um, but doubt it will be too much. So like if you pulled in something like so RX, it's kind of like all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you like RX, because yeah. yeah. that's yeah, right, what we Right now we don't have any yeah. external dependencies, and we have to keep it that way. Yeah, it's kind of a, probably a better, yeah. Yeah. better cost. Yeah. Like the flip side of that is then like, are you just, like you people who implement or use SDKs right, end up with like, 30 thread pools of like it, your network it? requests. It's, yeah. like, it's, but, I mean, it's better, I guess. I better than the alternative of like, you know, people forcing yeah. stuff on you. Yeah. Yeah. I, Bizarre Voice is big, right? Especially for me. We got like 8% but it's like most of the sales. It's not kind of as only four mobile people at this point. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Three iOS, one Android, and all of them are new except me. Uh, so, okay. so that was the mobile person for a while. That's cool. Yeah, that's all right. But, so it's not bad for me, but I don't know. And you do primarily iOS? Yeah, primarily iOS. Uh, Objective C, Swift, and both? Uh, both are, um, we have some... Are you going to this thing? Like, some of the new like, like, modules. Yeah. 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 All the SDK itself is familiar in Objective C. All the demo apps in each module are Swift. Yeah. It's a decent way to go, I think. Any new it works. Yeah, and then any prototype we do is... Yeah. 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 I moved here for, to work at a place called Mulloway, and my CTO was from Star Voice. Oh, yeah. But we both a lot of people. We both left that like, oh. job. Like he quit and moved somewhere. He moved to Dallas. Yeah. I quit, and now I'm here. So now, so. Which my current uh, like full time employment. I'm, I'm working for a startup in New York uh, that does basically pharmaceutical delivery. So like. Um, uh, I'm is, like, is that the one you were talking about? Like, no, that was oh. just that. I just made that up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not, not Uber. So, like, the, the oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, this is, this is like, two person team. Um, we're just launching. Yeah, we're just launching. So, basically, like, you would, this is a test one out, but you would create your visual test shit. Um, input like a subscription, uh, either, either if you're like, taking a picture of it, or yeah. oh, cool. um, now... Did you have to, like, image recognize the label? No, no we, it's, it's, it's really simple right now, because like, we're just starting, so we're just uploading images. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I thought it was doing it on the phone. Yeah. Okay. 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 We're just uh, uploading images, and we're also just like, uploading, like, Contact information for your doctor or your pharmacist oh, yeah. to transfer a, a 